Now, this is the second part of a two-sermon series, which last Sunday we went over the title, which is Pride Goes Before the Fall. And what we're going through is 2 Chronicles chapter 10. So if you want to go ahead and open the Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 10. Now, last Sunday we read verses 1 through 9, and today we'll finish reading through the rest of the chapter, and we'll go through verses 9 through 19. Now, let me just give us a, a quick little recap of what we went over last Sunday, so that some of you that might be new this Sunday kind of understand where we're at in the Scriptures. So we went over the two main characters in this passage, which is Jeroboam and Roboam. Jeroboam is in charge of the workforce, so he re represents the workers of Israel who have paid a heavy tax physically and financially for making Israel into a beautiful, physical nation. Solomon laid a heavy yoke upon the people. Now we're in transition in the kingdom of Israel. Solomon has passed away. His son, Rehoboam, now is the fourth king of Israel. And he'll be the final king of a united Israel because we're in the moment in time where Israel is about to split. Now, Ro Jeroboam goes to Rehoboam for uh, the Israelites as a representative and he pleads with Roboam to take this yoke off them. They're tired of basically slave labor. They've worked for years and they want a little breather. They want to have mercy. They want to have grace and they see an opportunity in the transition of the passing of the baton in kingship from Solomon to Roboam and they're trying to see if, if Roboam will have grace and mercy upon them. Now, Roboam hears Jeroboam and he goes seeks counsel from the elders. Great move here. We talked about this last Sunday. The elders basically said, give the people what they want and they'll love you and they'll serve you all the days of their life. That sounds really good, but Rehoboam didn't like that. His ego, his pride as a king, he didn't like that. He wanted to give the people what they wanted and have the people serve him out of reverence for love. Clearly we see in the scriptures that he wants to be a dictator. That he wants to rule uh, with an iron fist so to speak. So he ditches that advice from the elders. We talk about the elders, those who counseled his father Solomon, that they were wise. They ran this race of faith way further than Rehoboam. He, he's young. He's just getting started. And in many ways, Rehoboam is, is like a sheep. And, and the elders are the shepherds. And they're trying to give him some sound, godly counsel. And he rejects it. He goes to his, his buddies, to his, his boys, to his friends. And yeah, he goes to sheep, just like him, and, and he seeks sheepish advice, and he's going to make a very sheepish, because that's a word, decision. <laughs> Meaning he's going to make a foolish decision, and there's going to be consequences for what he is about to do. Pride goes before the fall. Now, most of us have heard that statement, pride goes before the fall, and now we're about to see the fall of Roboam, and then the fall of Israel with pursued later on down the road. But we're about to see the first trip, the first stumble of the nation of Israel. Now, Israel's fall isn't all Rehoboam's fall, but he is he's like the, at the crossroads of what is about to happen. And a lot of times when gentlemen leave the program early, they're making a bad decision. They say things like, well, God's out there, and you know, I came here, and I got what I need to do, and then they leave, they leave in the middle of the night, they, they, they leave just with a backpack full of stuff, they're, they're not making a good decision. Now, the gentlemen who walk out of this process early have already fell, even though they haven't fallen yet. See, pride goes before the fall. See, you see the stumble. We'll see people stumble, and then they, they leave our, our, our peripheral vision. We, they, they leave our our area of reference, and we don't know what happens to them. We saw the stumble, but most definitely there will be a fall. And at the end of this passage, we'll see that the fall ends in a great crash. It's typically terrible for the person who tripped, and it doesn't end well. And as we're going to see, this happens for Roboam. I was talking to somebody a little while ago, and they were telling me they left Duncan. They're a graduate, they're out doing life. And it seems like they're doing life okay. And this person told me that they are so excited that they're finally free. Free from people taking snapshots of their car when it backs up, right? <laughs> He's like, I'm just free. I'm, I'm able to not have people all in my business and, and, and watching my every move. 
And I sat there, and, and I, I answered him with grace and, and mercy. But see, that's the, that, the sad thing when we're a sheep that is turning away from a shepherd. We think freedom is to be shepherdless. That we don't have people in our business. That's not freedom, that's bondage. And this individual, unless they yoke themselves up quickly to a shepherd, they're in the wilderness alone. What happens to sheep in the wilderness alone? They get eaten alive. And see, as the body of Christ, we always need to be yoked to shepherds. We need to stay in the flock. We need safety and security. But sometimes we take bad advice and we go down bad ways. So let's start off in verse 9, 2 Chronicles chapter 10. He asked them, what is your advice? Now he's talking to the young men who grew up with him. How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten Lighten the, the yoke your father put on us. The young men who had grown up with him replied. Now remember, he's, sheep need to be shepherded, but he's, he's getting advice from the sheep. The people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us. A make our yoke lighter, grace mercy. Now here's what the younger men told them. This is, this is their sound sage wisdom. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. Oh, already off to a bad start. For my father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. This is terrible advice, ladies and gentlemen. See, a whip is bad. A scorpion whip is even worse. What that is, that's a whip with little metal shards or glass shards on the end of it. Now, if you had to choose between a whip or a scorpion whip, you're going to go with the whip. But these young men are saying, listen, they thought your father was, was tough. You're, you're a thousand times tougher. And we're going to see he's going to go with this latter advice. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Roboam, as the king had said. Come back to me in three days. The king answered them harshly, rejecting the advice of the elders. Now this is the crossroad of Israel. As we talked about last Sunday in the first part of this sermon is that Roboam had, had a front row seat. He sat in the splash zone of wisdom. His father was the wisest person that ever existed at that time. He, he asked God for wisdom and, and God gave it to him. King Solomon was wise. And we would draw strength and wisdom from the Proverbs that he wrote. Now, what are some of the Proverbs that he wrote? Lean not on your own understanding. <laughs> Roboam, leaning on his sheepish understanding by getting sheepish advice. Terrible. There's a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, it's destruction. Right here, in this passage, Roboam thinks it's right to answer the people of Israel harshly. Whips, I'll give you scorpions. In his mind, he thinks this is right. He forgot the wisdom his father passed down to him. Now, let's not just burn Roboam down. Let's all look at our own individual lives. I know for myself, specifically, if I apply this portion of the text to my life, I can see many times when I was being counseled to go the right way, and there was a way that seemed right to me, and it was the wrong way. And it didn't matter what you said to me, I was going to still do what I wanted to do because I thought it was right. But in the end, we would all discover, if you went down that path, that you were wrong. Verse 14, he followed the advice of the young men and said, My father made your yoke heavy, I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people. For this turn of events was from God to fulfill the word the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, through Elijah, the son of the, the Shionite. Now, God spoke to Jeroboam that he was going to be the first king of the divided kingdom of Israel. So this was God's sovereign plan. But nonetheless, Jeroboam is making some bad decisions in this process. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel. Now this is the great divide. 
This is the division of Israel. Look after your own house, David. So all the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Roboam still ruled over them. <coughs> Verse 18. King Roboam, now this is a bad move what he's about to do here. King Roboam sent out Adon Adoniram, who was in charge of the forced labor. So now this is the new guy who's in charge of the forced labor. So Jeroboam was the old guy who was in charge of the forced labor. And he went on the people's behalf to plead for grace and mercy. And now, now after the sentence has been handed down, Roboam is not giving them grace and mercy. He's judging them. He's condemning them, basically. He sends out the new representative of this. Terrible discernment on um, Roboam's part. But the Israelites stoned him to death. I don't know what he thought was going to happen uh, in this situation. King Roboam, however, managed to get into his chariot and escape to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Now this is the end of Israel as they would know it, as we would know it in the scriptures. The king of Israel would be split into two. Israel would be would move to the north and then Judah would be in the south. And Israel would be made up of ten tribes and Judah would be made up of two tribes. Of Judah and Benjamin would be in the nation of Judah. Now, the back and forth fighting would continue to take place between now the new king of Judah, Roboam, and now the, the new king of Israel, Jeroboam. They would fight back and forth. But they would both fail. They both not only fail in their fighting, but they would most importantly fail in their relationship with God. Now, we can say this in our addictions. I know I've said this. What I do doesn't matter. I'm only what? Hurting myself. But what you do definitely matters. And there's consequences, there's effects down the road that you are in denial about today. See, Roboam didn't understand the significance of the events that were happening that day. And then he would inherit disaster. He would not inherit a blessing because he sought to turn from counsel and make a prideful move. He tripped and stumbled and then we would see the rest of the fall through the Bible. Now, 2 Chronicles 12, 14 tells us about Roboam. It says that he did evil because he did not set his heart on seeking the Lord. Where, where are our hearts at today? Do we make the same foolish mistake that King Roboam does? I can do this daily, and Lord forgive me. And that is why it's important that we seek God moment by moment, because it is so easy to turn from sound advice and, and lock yourself up with some, some foolish advice. See, so what do we seek? What do we set our, our hearts on? And this is why Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah 29, 13. This is that Israel and Judah, Israel is already in exile. Now Judah is going into exile. And Jeremiah is, is saying, there's, there's hope, guys. We're going we're gonna to learn from our folly. We're going to learn from this. God does have a plan for us. He is going to bring us back. And he says this, in regards to where we set our hearts at, he says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now, Jesus would nail this down, the doctrine of regeneration in Matthew 5 8. He says that, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See, a heart touched from, by God seeks God. It's a heart that, that's been, been renewed, and God has opened the eyes, He's removed the scales from their eyes. They were dead, and now they're alive. Now they see that they're a sinner, and they see they need a Savior. This moment in time, this is what happens. You cry out for the Lord to save you, and it took a fall, a great crash, for Israel's eyes to be opened up. And when their eyes were opened, they were in bondage in Babylon, but guess what? You will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. It took a process for God to get them to the place that he was going to redeem them from. And all of us can reflect, and we can, we can relate to this, to this process. So what was the consequence or the consequences of Roboam not listening to the elders? Well, it was a divided kingdom. They would, they would fail in their covenant relationship with God. They would go into exile. They would fall to idols. They would forfeit the gift that God gave Israel, which was the promised land. Jeremiah 2, now I've preached through this passage before, but it highlights 
What happens after this defining moment? What happens because of Rehoboam's arrogance and pride? This is what Jeremiah chapter 2, starting in verse 1 says. So as I'm reading this, think of this. Think of that moment, that defining moment that King Rehoboam had for Israel. He had Israel in, in his hands. He had this treasure. He was living in the promised land. Life was good and life could continue to be good. But he chose not to listen to sound advice. Instead, he yoked himself up to the sheep. And he made a, an error in his ways because he followed what he thought was right. He didn't submit himself to what was right. And then a catastrophe would be born out of that. Now, this is years later, and this is what the catastrophe looks like. The word of the Lord came to me. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness. See, the beautiful thing about the covenant that God makes with us is that it is, it is established by God's promise. And it is executed to us by His grace and His mercy. It has nothing to do with our feelings and our emotions. And we can look at our marriages. Our marriages aren't established by feelings and emotions because they change. It is established by a promise, by a covenant that we make first and foremost with God and then with our spouses. Because <laughs> I remember the devotion of your youth. We can start out on fire, but as life happens, we... We can, easily, we can easily fade away. And that is why we are in covenant relationship with God. And thank God for those of us who have been saved by the grace and mercy in Christ's life, death, and resurrection. The Bible says what God starts, He finishes. Although we might go astray, He will bring us back into the fold. Through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord. The first fruits of His, of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty, and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, you descendants of Jacob, all you clans of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me, that they strayed so far from me? What fault did the Israelites find in a perfect, holy God? None. None. They followed worthless idols, and they became worthless themselves. See, we are what we worship. They did not ask, where is the Lord who, who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through a barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce. But you came and you defiled my land. Roboam and Jeroboam. Now the loss of Israel isn't just on their hands. Everybody failed in this process. They are the ones we are highlighting. The priest did not ask. See, we see the priest failed. Where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law, see the teachers of the law, they failed. They did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. So we see the kings failed as well in this covenant relationship with God. The prophets prophesied by Baal. The prophets failed. All the safeguards God gave Israel to stay united and to live in the land of milk and honey that God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They all filled, and the passage says, following worthless idols. See, this is why we need Christ to do everything for us in salvation. See, we need Christ to be our king, our priest, our prophet, our teacher, the temple, the sacrifice. And in the gospel, God counts Christ everything as ours. Amen. Men, that we aren't held with any responsibility in the salvational process because if we were, we would mess it up. <laughs> and Israel is a great reminder. They are a bad example of what we should not be as a church. Anything God trusts us with, we will mess up. That's why we have to cry out, Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, give me the hands to hold this gift, Lord, because my own hands will drop it. Lord, I need your divine intervention because without it, I am clueless, I am lifeless, I have no hope, I have no chance. This is why the gospel is called the good news. Because it is all of Christ and none of you. And God counts Christ's life, death, and resurrection as if it was your own. Therefore I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord. And I will bring charges against your children. Cross over to the coast of Cyprus and look, send to Kedar. And observe closely, see if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods 
at all. Jeremiah is saying this to Judah and to Israel. He's saying, like, look at these pagan nations. They have been more devoted to idols than you were to the one true God. Think about that. They were more faithful. They never turned from their idols, but yet here Israel has a special relationship with the God of the universe, and they turn to idols. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. See, God is love, but God is also wrath. God's not 90% love and 10% wrath. God is 50 love, 50 wrath. See, this is why we need Christ on the cross, because at the cross is the crossroads of where God's love and His wrath can meet. It is where His love redeems and His wrath is satisfied in His Son. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, Christ, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. This is idolatry. This is us seeking rest. This is Israel seeking rest and salvation in anything other than Christ. Anything other than God. So this is, this is why we need the living water in the gospel. Because apart from the living water in the gospel, we're all just broken cisterns. And so our prayer needs to be, Lord, Lord, create a new well in me. Lord, let me, let me get your well. Let me drink your water, your living water. That is the gospel. And so what can we learn from 2 Chronicles chapter 10 that we just went over? How can we apply this passage to our lives. Well, I think it's simple. As the proverb last Sunday we read, get wisdom, though it costs you all you have. Get understanding. Now, remember the Hebrew word for wisdom was hakma. It means wisdom, skill in war, skill, experience. See, Brother Paul knew the importance of hakma. He says this in Ephesians 6, 10-12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. How can I take my stand against the devil's schemes? How can I take my stand against false prophets, against false teachers who look like true teachers, who look like true prophets, who look like true children of God? Because I know the truth. Because I dip my bucket into the well of truth. So I can, I can stand against <coughs> falsehood, against lies, against schemes. Key word there, schemes, tricks. False teaching doesn't show up as like a big old sign that says false teaching. You might welcome it to your life because like, well, I mean, I can't really judge what that is. And like, you know, I know that pastor has a $20 million home, but he sold a lot of books. You know, he's, he loves the Lord. Like, I, I know, you know, yeah, he did say that one thing, but that could have been taken out of context. And, da, 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 da. and we make all these excuses, but we forget. We need to watch out for schemes. We need to be, we need to be more devoted to what the scriptures say than what we want them to say, or the love of the people that say what the Scriptures think they say to them. We need to be devoted to the Scriptures so we can watch out for schemes. Because people are sneaky. They're tricky. They're deceitful. Remember how sneaky and deceitful we were for the schemes of getting our drugs and our addiction? I mean, we could come up with a crazy plan and sorts of things. Or people would fall for all sorts of things. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Hakma, skill in war. See, we have skill in our spiritual battle because we, we stand firm in truth, because we read the scriptures, they renew our mind. We watch out for schemes. See, we have a real enemy, church. Now, before salvation, we were enemies of God. And then by God's saving grace, he has now made us enemies of Satan. <laughs> and we're friends with God. Amen? <laughs> and now we will, we will face opposition. We will face struggles. We will, we will face schemes of Satan. But it's all good. I'm not a Satan chaser. <laughs> because the Bible says, greater is he than you that is in the world. We just have to stand firm. So why am I, why am I saying all of this? Because Roboam lacked Hopna. He lacked skill in war. He lacked wisdom. See, he, he sought foolishness that he believed to be wisdom. Now, those of us who used to use drugs, remember that first move when you went all in on drugs? It was wisdom. 
I remember the first time that I that I did oxys. I remember the first time I did it, I said, this is it. I feel more alive, I feel more confident, I'm, I'm alert, I feel smarter, I think I can do things better. I was like, this is wisdom. Do this all the days of your life. And things will go well for you. But that was foolishness that I thought was wisdom. Now I believe there's three things that we can learn from Roboam through this passage. Whenever we're at a crossroad in life, because we'll be at many crossroads in life, sometimes it's yearly, sometimes it's monthly, sometimes it's daily. Like we need the Lord's grace and mercy to lead us, to guide us, to direct us. And so number one, whenever you face any crossroad in your life where you have to make a decision, number one, we seek wisdom in God's Word. We accept God's Word as His Word. And we believe what it says, no matter if it ruffles our feathers, no matter if we don't necessarily fully understand it. And we run all our thoughts through it. And this is what it looks like. How do I, Lord, how do I, how do I become a godly husband? Read God's Word. How do I become a godly father? Read God's Word. Lord, how am I to be a better friend? Read God's Word. Lord, should I hang out with these people? Read God's Word. Lord, how should I dress? Read, read God's Word. How should I act? Read God's Word. Lord, is that a sin? Read God's Word. Lord, is this a blessing? Read, read God's Word. See, we have, we have the answers all here. This is the revelation of God. Hakma. Number two, we seek wisdom from those who have ran the race of faith before us. The elders. We, we submit ourselves to be guided and directed in truth. Because if you're being shepherded by a biblical elder, all they're doing is shepherding you in this truth that you have. And they shepherd you in it so that you learn it. It's very difficult to... Read your Bible all by yourself. There's some things you can learn on your own, but there's many things that you need to learn by a shepherd of God's truth to direct you, to shape you, to guide you. Not in their way, but in teaching you of the way. 2 Timothy 3, 14-17 highlights this. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's why whenever I read the scriptures, I always know, whenever we read them out loud in a, in a room full of people, it's always doing two things. The word of God is always saving the lost and sanctifying the found. It comes from this passage here, which are able to make you wise for salvation. How do we know the gospel? Because of God's word. Through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly put for every good work. Not just some good work, but every good work. Alright? Now some of you guys are on a little bit. We're getting ready to wrap it up right here. Okay? Amen? Just, just hang on tight. Don't unbuckle yet. The third thing that we can learn from 2 Chronicles chapter 10 is this. Now I think this is probably one of the most important ones. Is that we pray for wisdom. Lord, I need grace and mercy. See, we look towards Christ in His prayer life. How did Christ pray? Well, I look at the, the most vulnerable, most weakest moment of our Lord was probably when He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And He said, Father, take this cup of me, the cup of wrath, being nailed to a cross. And He said, yet now my will be done, but yours. So what can we learn from that? That we pray, Lord, Lord, I lift this desire up to you, but yet not my will, but yours. And so we must trust the Lord, and we must remember that sometimes there's a difference between our desire and what we want. God to do, and we will want, want to happen, might be different from God's will. But nonetheless, we know that His ways are better than our ways, and we trust God through our life. Even though He might not always answer the prayer of our desires, we can trust that He will always answer the prayer of His will, and we know that His will for our lives is good. And so we must trust that. I always love ending with this. This is going to be the cherry on top, and it's going to wrap everything up. Most of us in this room are super familiar with this passage. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now we know this to be Christ. This is the gospel. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man. Row a bone. 
who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now this could be a salvational crash that will crash you into eternal condemnation. And that is why repentance and faith in Christ is always of its utmost importance. 247-365. All the days of a person's life. Because you don't want to be outside of this and your life faces that eternal crash apart from the saving grace and faith in Christ. Amen? Now number two, this is for us Christians. Number two. That we don't allow our life to fall apart or to fall away from God's truth when crossroads present themselves. That we learn to, to seek God for wisdom in His Word, in His church, the elders, and in prayer. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.